first two weeks, we've talked about anxiety, and today we are talking about temptation. Today we are talking about temptation. We all have something that we are tempted by. It could be many different things. It could be lying or gambling, a a sexual sin, pornography, alcohol, overeating, overspending. I mean, the list could go on and on. We are all tempted by, by something, but what is that thing? Psalm says that we have a bend to certain things. So what might tempt you might not tempt me. And what might tempt him might not tempt her. It might be different. But we all have something that, that tempts us. But here's what I want you to know is that you are not alone. And so my prayer has been from the beginning of the series and really through the entire series is really threefold for all of us today. That each one of these topics that we look at over the next number of weeks and we're looking at a number of things is that we come to a realization of a few things. And the first we saw in Psalm 86 in week one when David said, I am poor and needy. David recognized that he had a problem. And so I'm hoping that through this series, if there's something that lands, that is something that specifically you need to deal with or work on in your life, that you won't think to yourself, man, this is a great message for him or for her or for that guy online, but that we would look in our own hearts and say, Lord, is there something in my heart that I'm missing? The uh, the nature of deception is you do not know you're being deceived. Does that make sense? It's the nature of deception. You can't say, oh, I know I'm being deceived. That's not deception, friend, all right? The nature of deception is you don't know you're being deceived. And so what we need many times in our life, and I pray through the power of the Holy Spirit, is a realization that, man, there's something I have to work on. That's the first thing. The the second thing is I hope you understand through our time together these next number of weeks is that you are not alone. You are not the first person. You are not the last person to have a struggle. You probably don't have it the easiest, but you also probably don't have it the hardest. But you're not alone in the struggle, in the things that we are going to be talking about. And the third thing I pray over our time over these next few weeks and today as well is that you would take the steps necessary to get victory over whatever that struggle is. That you would take the steps necessary. Understanding that you're alone is one thing. Understanding you're not alone rather is is one step. Understanding you're a problem, you have a problem is a is a step, but that you would you would you would be free to step into the light. And we've said freedom doesn't come quickly and it comes with a fight. But I believe there's freedom in Jesus' name. And and so today what we're going to do is we are going to take a a, a macro level look at temptation from a lot of different angles today. Probably what could be three sermons. We're going to cram it into one sermon today as we talk about temptation. And so I want us to pray together and then we're going to just jump right in this morning. Would you bow your heads and pray with me very quickly? Two simple things this morning, watching online. Would you just simply pray, Lord, speak to me. Lord, speak to me. Deception is very deceiving in and of itself. uh, Temptation, rather, is very deceiving in and of itself. And so maybe you would just pray, Lord, speak to me. Is there a blind spot in your life, my life, something that we're missing that we need to acknowledge? And so would you pray, Lord, speak to me? And secondly, would you just pray, Lord, speak through Grant today? Speak through Grant today. Father, we come before you in humility, Lord, really praying in Psalm 86 that you would teach us your ways, that we could walk in your truth. Lord, we are all susceptible to temptation. We are not above it. And so I pray that today's message might might sound an alarm today for those who are close to sin, To, to those who are close to making a choice that might affect their life, their, their future, and, and the lives of, of so many others. God, I, I pray that you would just open our eyes today. God, I, I pray that we would again walk in your ways, in your truth today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our definition for temptation today, it's in your notes if you're following along, and I hope you are, is this. Temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. I didn't come up with this definition, but I love this definition. Temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. It's something that promises you are going to feel so much better if you do this. It it might be against God's word. It might be against what God has, has taught you through his word or what you know to be right, but it's going to be so worth And so we step into it. Anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. 
It's our working definition of temptation today. Write this down. Five truths about temptation I'm going to give you today. Number one, we're all tempted. We are all tempted. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful. So the Apostle Paul writes to this church at Corinth, and this church at Corinth was a church that was filled with, in this city, wickedness, and and filled with idolatry, and filled with with many different sins, and, and all around them. And so these people put their faith and trust in Christ. But they lived in a culture of ungodliness and a culture of of immorality. And so what happens is, what happens to all of us is we still struggle because we still have flesh on us and we live in this world. So these Corinthian believers accepted Christ as their savior and they went back to work and guess what happened? They were still tempted. They were still tempted to do the wrong thing. They they were still a pull to, to do the wrong thing. Even though they were saved, they felt the power of temptation. And so we can feel that as well, and we can get discouraged, and we can feel like we're the only one. And Paul is like, no, 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 this is a humanity thing. No temptation has overtaken you except what's just common to man. He says, you're not the only one. We are all tempted. We're all tempted. And and it's important to, to understand that. We see it in Scripture, right? David, Samson fall into temptation. Daniel and Jesus didn't. And sin starts where? Way back in the beginning. Turn back in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 very quickly. We're going to start back at the beginning today. Again, this is a big overview today, a large overview of uh, of temptation today. But let's go back to just to Genesis chapter 2 very quickly. And we're not doing an extensive look at this, but I just want us to see it today. God has in Genesis chapter 2, he's created the world. He's created man. He places Adam in the garden. In Genesis 2 verse 16, it says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying... Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge and good, of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So God puts Adam in the garden to tend to the garden, to watch over the garden, and he says you can have everything in the garden. It is all yours, but do not eat of this one tree. And so Adam is created with this ability to choose, right from wrong. Trust God or disobey God. We have that same will today, that we can make a choice. Are we going to trust God, trust what God's word says, or are we going to trust ourselves? Are we going to obey what God says, or are we going to disobey? You continue to read, God creates Eve, a helper fit for the man. And then in Genesis chapter 3, what happens? The serpent comes along, the deceiver, the scripture says, and he begins to do what the deceiver does, which is deceive. He's still doing it today. Genesis chapter 3, verse 2. We're skipping ahead, but the woman said to the serpent. The serpent starts to have this interaction with Eve, starts to deceive Eve, starts to tell Eve, you're missing out in something. Because that's the temptation, is you're missing out. If you step into this, you're going to be so much better. You're going to feel so much better. You're going to have this joy. God's trying to keep something from you. He's using the same game plan today with us that he used back then. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, nor you touch it, lest you die. Now, again, we can unpack this for a lot of different ways, but it's interesting because Eve added some things here. Eve's instructions had probably come from Adam, and so Adam, rather, and so she she adds, "Don't, don't touch the tree. She also doesn't express that it's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we don't know if this is the first example of men not giving all the details, you know what I'm saying, which we can be bad about. We don't know that, all right, for sure. But it seems like there's something going on here. Again, Eve does catch a lot of grief, but it sort of seems like uh, Adam didn't give her all some pertinent information. I- I'm just saying, when you, when you look at it here, it seems like this husband wasn't protecting his wife. Again, I'm, I'm just saying. But the tempter comes and continues his work. The serpent says to the woman, you shall, will not surely die. Verse 5. For God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The enemy's pitching these lines to us today. Your life is going to be so much better if you just do this. God's trying to keep something from you. God God has written this book because it's just a book of rules and laws to keep you from having a good time. When the reality is when you look at it, you follow this book, your life is going to be so much better. 
but it's not how it's painted with the enemy. So Eve is fed these lies, and we learn a lot from this temptation of Eve. Eve, the, the enemy promises big but never delivers. He promises big but never delivers. You would be so much better if you click on this link, if you place that bet, if you take that drink, if you buy that outfit, you are so missing out is the line that the tempter uses today. God's trying to keep you from something. He really just doesn't want you to have fill in the blank, whatever that thing is. And it's the same game plan that he's used from the beginning. Look back at verse 6. So when the woman saw, underline saw, we're going to see, we're not going to go there to 1 John. Write this reference down off to the side of your notes, 1 John 2, 16. Because what we really see here is the game plan of the enemy. Saw, when she saw that it was good, it's the lust of the flesh, that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes. Underline that phrase, pleasant to the eyes. It's the lust of the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. Underline that, make one wise. This is the pride of life. You can go look at that reference later. First John 2, 16. Scripture says she took of its fruit and ate. She gave to her husband with her and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And so we see, A, the origin of temptation. Sin enters the world because of temptation. Sin enters the world because of temptation at the very beginning. Skip up in your Bible, and this isn't on the screen. They might be able to pull it up, but back to verse 2 and 3. Look real quick what it says in 2 and 3. Just a couple interesting things that I found this week in study. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the, circle that phrase, mist of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat, nor should you touch it, lest ye die. The midst of the garden is, in some translations, in the middle of the garden. And what I find interesting is I was studying and thinking about this week that the middle of the garden means two things. Number one, it meant they probably had to pass it every day, depending on how large the, the, the Garden of Eden was. But in the middle of the garden, you know, we're going to face temptation every day. You don't get to know, hey, this coming Thursday, temptation's coming. Be ready. Because we could face temptation every day. But it's also interesting to me that if it's in the middle of a garden, you know what they had to do? They had to walk by everything else that God had provided to get to the temptation in the middle. All that God had provided, all that God has given us, and if we're not careful, what do we want? The one thing we're not supposed to have. All that God gives us, all the blessing that God gives us. We talked about anxiety last week. I mean, I think that's why we have to be grateful people, because when we're not grateful people, we can become envious, covetous people. We want something else. We want something more. And the enemy plays that up in our hearts and our minds, and he tempts us. Man, you're missing out. You could have this. You could have that. You are so much better than that situation. And we step into temptation. We are drawn to what we don't have. And because of this, Romans 5.12 says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. So Adam and Eve's choice to fall into temptation in the garden, that sin that entered the world through Adam is now passed down to all of us today, and it's why we're born with what the scripture says is a sin nature. Because from the very, very beginning, which we all go back to Adam and Eve, sin has been passed down. And so now we have this sin nature. We see the enemy throughout scripture. He pops up in Matthew chapter four at tempting Jesus. This great tempter is tempting Jesus, but it started back in the garden. B, write this down, the process of temptation. The process of temptation. A big overview on temptation today. James 1 says, verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now, I think this is important for us because we see in James this, this process of temptation. But, but knowing this can help us out. That, that phrase in verse 14, drawn away, it is a metaphor that, that actually is taken um, from, from a fish 
that is enticed by bait. So this is the idea what that, that drawn away means. That, that drawn away is like a fish that is attracted to and then seeking after bait. This is what temptation is. So I had Justin Hartley uh, give me some fishing stuff today because I'm 49 and know no fishing stuff. So I, uh, I'll be turning my man card in after service if you'd like to see me after the service. And so the reason I had you pray for me today was for God to speak through me and for me to not injure myself. If I'm being completely honest, I should have added that. So Justin brought me some bait right here. So I, I want you to imagine, if you will, Frank the fish today. Okay, y'all tracking with me? Frank the fish is, is swimming in the lake, and he, he's just chilling. Now, he's a little bit hungry, and he begins to swim, and he, and he begins to, to swim into an area of the lake that his mom said, don't go swimming in this area of the lake. You've had some cousins that swam out there. We never saw them again. So just stay away. Frank. But Frank is hungry. He's a grown man. So Frank's like, I'm just going to swim. What's it going to hurt? It's a beautiful day. And so he's swimming. And all of a sudden, he hears a splash. And he looks. And all of a sudden, he sees this guy. He hits the water. And he's like, well, hold up. But this isn't Frank. This is a big fish. This is a big lure here. But imagine Frank's a big fish. All right? Track him. So Frank all of a sudden looks over. And he's like, whoa, hold up now. Where did that come from? The light hits it off of the sun into the lake, and it glimmers, and it's, and it's making this noise. And he's like, well, I'm going to get a little closer to this and see what's going on over here. And all of a sudden, it moves just a little bit, moves just a little bit. So Frank begins to, to slide closer. He's hungry. No one's around. His mom told him not to do this, to stay away from this stuff, but this thing is just beautiful. No one is going to know. It is right there. And so he grabs it, bites it, eats the whole thing, one gulp, and all of a sudden, what happens? <laughs> Frank doesn't know what's going on. He's going 500 miles an hour. <laughs> Frank ends up in a boat. He can't breathe. He's never seen the sun before. There's a very large monster wearing all camo with a big beard, brush of hair off of his face. That's yelling at him. He's got a fish, a hook through his eye. His eye has now fallen out. This man is manhandling him. He feels like this must be the end. All of a sudden, he hears. He can barely distinguish it. Someone yell, he's too small. And he gets thrown back in the water. Frank takes off, headed home. He's got one eye. It's like, how am I going to explain this to my mom? He comes up with some cockamamie story. About a rock and bumping in, not paying attention. Next day, he goes out again, and he's like, that was crazy, but I got to see what that thing was. <laughs> so he heads back over there again. Splash. He looks both ways. Actually, just looks one way. He's only got one eye. But he looks this way. <laughs> Frank goes up takes the bait, and then you never see Frank again. It's the last time we see Frank. You say, Grant, that's just ridiculous. But you know what it is? It's what James is saying, that's that idea of being drawn away. It's this idea of bait is in the water, and it catches our attention. And the truth is, for you guys that know fishing in here, and you guys know some fishing, is there's, there's all kinds of different bait, depending on where you are, depending on, on what you're trying to catch, and it some of them make noise, and some of them don't make noise, and all they are are different temptations that are thrown in the water to hook the fish, to entice, to draw away, and the enemy has seemingly an unimaginable number and options of bait for you and for me, and he knows what's going to get your attention. He knows what's going to get your attention. He knows what you've fallen into before, and he knows what you've said no to, and this ain't going to work for her, but I know what I do know. If I toss this out there, she's going to start thinking. She's going to be interested in this, and I haven't got her, but she's come close a lot of times, so we're going to add a little bit more to it. We're going to add something different to it. This so when James is saying that they're they are drawn away, they're drawn away, it says, by his own desires by his own desire. Here's what this means. This is not in your note. Just write these couple words down. Write this word down. It starts with a thought. Just write thought down. It's not in the notes. Just write down thought. We, we begin to think about it. Man, what would that be like? It, it starts as a thought, and then it goes to our imagination. Frank is looking at that bait, and he's like, man, that would taste so good right now if that was in my stomach. I haven't had anything 
like that for a long time. There's nothing else out here. It goes to our imagination. And then we start to justify, justify. I deserve it. No one else is around. I've been working hard. I've done all these things. I I deserve this. And then we make a choice. So, So it is a thought, it is imagination, justify, and then a choice is made. This is what James is saying. When we are enticed, we are drawn away by our own lust. Then he says in verse 15, and then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. He says when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. That's James 1.15. Write that reference down. What James is saying is we, we are drawn away. We like to blame the devil for everything, but the reality is, friends, we got it in us. This flesh that is on us. And that's why there's a battle for the spirit and there's a battle for the flesh. And that's why we got to make sure we are feeding the spirit in our life. Being a youth pastor for years, I would say that there is a wolf inside all of us. And whatever wolf you feed the most is the one that's going to have the victory. If you feed to the flesh, this is just a practical terms. You feed to the flesh, you are going to from the flesh reap corruption. But you feed the spirit, you are going to reap life everlasting. And if we're not in the Bible and we're not reading God's word and we're not praying and we're not watching what we're listening to and, and watching what we're putting in our eyes and we are constantly feeding what the world has, how can we act surprised when the wolf inside of us of the flesh wins the victory? What, what, what decisions are we making? What decisions are we making? What are we putting into our lives? James says this comes from inside of us and it, and it draws us away. And then after sin, we have the consequence of sin. And friend, I want to tell you today, I don't want to discourage you today, but I pray your eyes are open today because this is so important for all of us. You can choose to sin, but you cannot choose the consequences of sin. You can choose, bro, I'm going to do what I want to do. I didn't come here to have you yell at me, preacher boy. I'm going to do what I want to do when I want. You're right. But you can't choose the consequences of your action. You don't get to choose those. And sometimes they don't always look fair. Why does this guy get away with this thing, but then she doesn't get away with it? Why does she not get, he, he not get away with it, rather, but she does? We don't get to choose. Preacher would always say this, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Sin is the temptation, but it comes from within us, and then there's an enemy that tempts, but there's a process of it. That's why I never have liked the phrase, I I, I accidentally fell into sin. I don't agree with that. Somewhere along the line, you made a choice. Somewhere along the line, you made a choice, and that choice led to sin. Now, I do believe in doing ministry as long as I have that there's extreme circumstances of children being exposed to things, and I believe that sin and responsibility is on some parents or some other adults, not on these children. That's a message for another day. But we're all tempted. Number two, it is not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, we do not have a high priest, this is Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. It is not a sin to be tempted. Again, go back and read Matthew chapter 4 if you like this afternoon. Jesus was, was tempted. But that verse in Hebrews chapter 4 is saying that we, we have a high priest who knows what it's like to be tempted, yet he is without sin. That's that reference, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted, and yet he was without sin. I read this quote this week by John Wilbur Chapman. It said this, temptation is the tempter looking through the keyhole into the room where you are living. Sin is drawing back the bolt and making it possible for him to enter. You can't avoid someone coming to your door or looking through the keyhole, but you control the deadbolt. Like we can be tempted, but we get to control if we're gonna step in that. It's not a sin to be tempted. Number three, you you are never above temptation. This is so important. You are never above temptation. Back to Corinthians, Paul is writing to this church and he's like, listen guys, I want you to know it can happen to anybody. Don't get prideful. Don't get arrogant. He says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. He says, take heed. He says, be be aware. You, You think you stand, but if you're not careful, you will fall. He's talking about temptation. Put that reference up, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 
He says, don't get arrogant. None of us are beyond temptation. None of us are beyond it. We cannot think, oh, man, that's never going to happen to me. Be very careful what you say. Be very careful what you say. Because none of us are beyond it. Another quote I read this week, temptation works like rocks in a harbor. When the tide is low, everybody sees the danger and avoids it. But Satan's strategy in temptation is to raise the tide and to cover over the dangers of temptation. Then he likes to crash you upon the covered rocks. Be very careful that we say, I would never. It's why I have more and more appreciation the older I get for brothers and sisters who have some age on them who have been faithful, who have been faithful, who have just been faithful. Because you look around and there's a lot of men and women that fall. And man, I don't want that to be my testimony. I I, I don't want that to be your testimony. It's why the scripture says we are to be on guard. That's why Ephesians says we are to walk. It's a, a, a New King James word, circumspectly. And what that word means, it means we have to keep our head on a swivel and pay attention to what's going on around us. We got to be on guard because none of us are above it. And, and I, used to, I used to say the enemy will attack us where we are weak. So fortify where we're weak because we all know our weaknesses. And I still think that that's true. But I've also seen and experienced the enemy will attack us where we're strong because we can get lazy. We can get real lazy. Well, I know I'm not, I don't struggle here. And so I'm going to focus all this here. Listen, friend, but by God's grace, we don't know what we're going to struggle with. And and none of us are beyond it. You're not above anything. Be wise. Stay humble. Number four, God will never tempt you. Again, this high view of what temptation is from above. God doesn't tempt. Back in James chapter one, it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is what? Drawn away By his own desires, our own desires and entice. God doesn't tempt, but God will allow it. God gives us trials, but he does not tempt. Temptation's purpose is to pull us into sin and to draw us from God. Trials and tests are to pull us into a deeper relationship with the Father and our relationship with him. So a temptation is looking to pull us from God. A trial or a test in our life is looking to encourage us to grow our relationship with him. There's different. God doesn't tempt. Number five, there's always a way out of temptation. There's always a way out of temptation. Back to 1 Corinthians. We're jumping 1 Corinthians and James here as, as Paul is writing and speaking into these churches. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. We, we all face it. We, it looks differently. He says, but God is faithful. Look at the person beside you and say, God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God makes a way of escape. I've shared this with you before. I feel like I'm having you do a lot of stuff that's extra on your notes today. But I want you to draw these five boxes. Can we toss these boxes up on the screen real quick? I want you to draw these five boxes. If you've heard me talk about temptation, you've drawn these boxes before. But this is how my mind works. It says God makes a way out of temptation. So I think of it like this. If the box on the left over here, the largest box is box number one, it means that our way out of temptation starts off very, very big. There's a big way of escape. You're first introduced to this sin. This thought has come in your mind. You cast the thought down. You stay away from that situation. You're like, I don't want nothing to do with it. Frank the fish, first and foremost, should not listen to his mom and not went to that side of the lake. That's the big box. The big box is, Frank, why are you over there? You know you're not supposed to be there. Doing something you're not supposed to do. And then slowly for our man Frank, for this horrible analogy, he's cutting through box after box after box. And so all of a sudden, that thing is right in front of him. And he's like, I can do nothing but eat this thing. And for us, it fleshes itself out very, very differently. Maybe for you, it's what you watch on the internet. Maybe it's pornography. So I would encourage you, you know that this is an issue in your life. The big box of that is make some decisions now so you do not have to uh, uh, resist the temptation when it falls in your lap. I'm not going to keep my phone in my bedroom. I'm going to 
have some locks on my computer. I'm going to do some things to be wise. Because what you don't want to be is step five is on your computer at one o'clock in the morning saying, I can't resist the temptation. Well, you've already made five choices to put you in that position. Does that make sense? And so I said, when God says, hey, he gives us a way out, is he gives us the Holy Spirit and wisdom now to make choices right now to be wise. Mar- married men in the room, women as well, my personal opinion is don't get emotionally attached if you're married to someone from the opposite sex. You are setting yourself up for disaster. Amen. You're setting yourself up for disaster. I know it's old school and it's a different day than I'm just going to be old school. But I'm just very cautious with relationships with people of the opposite sex because I, I want to be in the box. I want to be in the first box there, that large box. I want to stay as far away as I can. I, I've tried to live my life. And again, you can't control everything, and I haven't nailed this for the record. But I've tried to live my life a few steps away from sin so that if I make a mistake, I'm like, I shouldn't have done that. I'm right here. I'm not off of the ledge. Does that make sense? So I'm going to try to be wise. I'm going to try to be conservative. You're like, Grant, you're supposed to say that you're a preacher. Maybe I am. I don't know. But there's a lot of preachers that don't. But I want that to be my heart. There's a lot of things that I say no to. Men, Married men, women in the room, you need to keep your distance. If not, that box is getting smaller and smaller. And now you're having coffee, talking about your issues that you have at home. And man, they just understand me. And the enemy's just luring you in, luring you in, luring you in. Man, there's nothing that I could have done, Grant. You don't understand. I was in this position. There's no way I could have said no. Well, bro, you're in another city by yourself with another woman. You should have said no five steps ago. But now you're right there and you're hooked. And the enemy just sits back and laughs. It's funny how the enemy, how, what is it? What is, uh, what is that preacher's name? Jerry Vines used to say about Jonah. There's always a boat going to Joppa. The enemy's always ready. Always ready. Always ready to throw that temptation in. Specifically when we're weak, when we're discouraged, when we're spiritually drained, the enemy loves to jump into those situations, and then you are hooked, and you lose a lot more than an eye. You can lose a marriage. You can lose a testimony. You can lose relationships. You can lose your children. You can lose it all. And the enemy sets back and laughs at you, and then he's on to the next sucker because that's what the enemy does. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about me cares about hurting the name of Christ through me and through you as we lose our testimony. So guys, we've got to be wise. And maybe for some of you today, this isn't like a, hey, cheerio, let's go have a great week. Maybe today for you is the day that you're in box five, or maybe you are already the whole way down and you've already sinned. Listen, today is the day for you to make it right. Come clean, confess, repent, get help, whatever it is. Grant, you don't, you don't know what you're asking. Yes, friend, I do know what I'm asking. I would say you don't know what you're playing with. You are playing with fire, and it's going to cost you more than you could ever imagine. Temptation destroys lives. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you want to pay. I mean, this is a message from my heart. God, reveal in my heart, am I missing something in my life? I don't want to have a blind spot. That's the thing with blind spots is we don't see them. I don't want to have a blind spot in my own heart and life that hurts the ministry, that hurts my wife, that hurts my children, that hurts my testimony to the Lord. God, if there's something, reveal that. That needs to be our spirit. That's back to that, back to Psalm 86. I'm poor and needy. Lord, teach me your ways, O Lord, that I can walk in your truth. And none of us are by this. If you're here today and you feel like, God, Lee, he's talking specifically to me. Brother, I'm talking to everybody in the room to examine our own hearts. And it can happen to any of us. I remember specifically, and I'm not throwing shade, but someone that preached from this platform many years ago talking about the dangers of sin and being wild, and he, and he was in the middle of it right then, and it cost him everything. And it breaks my heart that I don't ever want that to be my testimony or my, your testimony or your story. Again, I'm not throwing shade. It can happen to anyone. Friend, God loves you I love you, and I want to see you do well. God wants you to experience freedom, but it's never going to happen while you're living in hidden sin. You're never going to experience the desire and the freedom that God has for you. Listen, God can't bless what he's already cursed. He can't bless what he's already cursed. Then he calls us to the light. He calls us to freedom. So, Grant, what does that mean? What am I supposed to do? James chapter 4. He says, he gives more 
grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Friend, I I don't think that you can fathom the love that God has for you, and I don't think you can fathom the grace that God has for you either. That passage of scripture in Isaiah, my mind's drawing blank for the reference there, but uh, it says, um, your ways are not my ways, says the Lord of hosts, for your ways are higher than my ways from Isaiah. If you go back and read the chapter before that, you know what that's talking about? God's grace and mercy. That chapter, is ta- it doesn't mean God thinks differently than us. Yes, he does. But what that verse is actually talking about is God's grace and mercy is so much greater than you can ever imagine. Because you probably wouldn't give grace to you. You wouldn't give mercy to you. But God says, I give grace, and I give mercy, and my love endures forever. It's the grace that God has for you. James says he gives more grace. He says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Friend, if you have been hooked by temptation and caught in sin, please don't let this message guilt you into hiding. Let it embolden you to step into the light of God's grace, to step into the light of God's mercy. What does that verse say? He resists the proud. He resists the one that doesn't want help, that wants to figure it out. He says, okay, figure it out. But he gives grace to the humble. Friend, I tell you what side I want to be on. I want to be on the side that God gives grace to. I want to be on the side that God's mercy is there for. And he says, it's the humble. So how do we fight temptation? He says there, submit to God. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Write that down. A, submit to God. How are we going to fight temptation? This is a short answer to fight temptation that's much longer. But how do we fight temptation? He says, submit to God. Again, back to Psalm 86, which we started our series off with. You're not alone. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I'll walk in your truth. God, I submit to your ways. I submit to what your word says. Listen, we live in in this social media world of, of Twitter, X, TikTok, Facebook, where everybody has an opinion on everything. But friend, I can promise you what God's word says isn't voted on. God's word says what it says. It doesn't matter what the culture says. It doesn't matter what everybody else says. Are we gonna trust in what God's word says? What does God's word say is right? What does God's word say is wrong? What does God's word, that's submitting to God. I'm not doing what everybody else says because it's the thing to do. I don't go to every movie that the world tells me to go to. You're like, well, you're legalistic. No, no, I'm not legalistic, but I have the Holy Spirit of living God inside of me that gives me wisdom. I can't tell you how many times I'll watch a preview for a movie. You can ask my kids, and I'm so pumped about going to see a movie, and then I'll read the reviews on it. I'm like, I'm not going to put myself in that position. I'm not going to put myself in a position to watch that and then be tempted by what I see on the screen. I'm just not going to do it. So I say no to a lot of things that I want to do. I want to do them. But I'm like, no, I can't do that because I'm not going to be enticed. Why? I want to submit to God. I want to submit to his ways. And sometimes that's saying no. And sometimes it means, hey, you guys go ahead and knock yourself out. I'm not the Holy Spirit for you. I got the Holy Spirit inside of me, and he's telling me what to do. You do what you want to do. Now, I don't say that to my family. I say, you better not go see that movie. But anyway, that's a whole other story. (laughs) They're adults now. They do what they want. Listen, we can't trust ourselves or public opinion. We have to submit to his way. He created you. He knows what's best for you. He loves you and has a purpose for your life. Submit to his way. B, resist the devil. Resist the devil. I love that word. It says submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That that word resist right there, it's from two Greek words, stand and against. So that resist right there isn't a passive word. It means it's going to be a fight. It means stand, hold your ground, and again, start moving forward. So to resist the enemy is not just like, ah! No, to resist the enemy means I'm holding my ground, and I'm standing, and I'm pressing forward. I mean fight. Victory that you're going to have in your life and my life is going to cost us something, but it's going to be a fight. Famous Christian author named Hermes wrote this, the devil can wrestle against the Christian, but he cannot pin him. The devil can wrestle against the Christian, but he can't pin him. Listen, we have the ultimate victory, but the devil loves to wrestle against us, loves to pull us, loves to discourage us. How do we resist? I'm going to give you these super quick. I'm going to give you your AARP today. Here we go. Write this down. A, avoid. How do we resist temptation? Avoid. It is easier to avoid temptation than to resist it. Write this reference down. I'm telling you to write a lot of things down today. I apologize. Proverbs 4, 14 and 15. Do not enter the path of the wicked. This is not on the screen. And do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. 
Do not travel on it, turn away from it, and pass on. So, so what, what, what the scripture is saying in Proverbs there, and, and for your, your life and my life, is what, what is your temptation? What, what is the thing that, that, that draws you? And he says, avoid it. Like, stay away from it. Whatever it costs, stay away from it. Get rid of your phone, stay away from it. You, you can't go to the after party with you. You can't go after work gathering because you can't say no to that drink. Stay away from it. Like, what is that thing, that bend that you have to sin? Stay away from it. Run away from it. Avoid it like it's the plague. Sell your boat. Stop going to the establishment. Find a new way home. Don't drive by that store anymore. Whatever that thing is, avoid it. Other than putting yourself in a position that you might not have the ability to resist. Listen, God's plan and his ways for your life are so much more important. And you're like, Grant, that's just sort of crazy, man. You're, out, you're talking wild talk, getting rid of things and doing things. You know what? I think there's a way, a reason why the scripture says there's the narrow way and few there be that find it. And that's not talking specifically about temptation, but I think that there's a small few who take the steps necessary to get the victory they really need to get in their life. And so many Christians are just beat up for a lifetime because they won't make choices on the front end. They're going to cost them something. And there's a reason why it's called discipleship, because it takes discipline and hard work. It's going to take some effort. It's going to take saying no to some things. If we're going to be all that God has for us to be, but we have to avoid it. Number two, accountability. How are we going to resist temptation? Uh, accountability. I got to go lightning fast. Ask this question. Does anybody know you're struggling? Does anybody know you have a struggle? Friend, you're not alone. Stop believing the lie that you have to fight alone. The enemy whispers don't tell. God whispers come into the light. Sin grows best in darkness. Come into the light. You need to pull some people in. Number three, regular Bible intake. This is so simple, but it's so important. Get into the book. How did Jesus win the victory over the enemy in Matthew chapter 4? Quoting God's word. Quoting the scriptures. Quoting the scriptures. you got to get some scripture memorized. John Bunyan said, either this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. James 1.22 says, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word of God, which is able to save your souls. Implanted word. Write this down. Lastly, prayer prayer. How how are we going to resist? How are we going to fight? Prayer. Prayer of confession and repentance. Prayer for strength. Prayer for wisdom. Prayer, God, who can I confide in? Listen, God is for you, loves you, has prepared a place for those he loves and calls his own, and we have to put our trust in him. Listen, temptation is real, but you can get victory. You can get victory. If we're not careful with sin in our life, we can become some so callous to it, it doesn't even bother us. The conviction doesn't even bother us anymore. What a sad place to be. Then maybe the prayer is, God, convict me like never before, that I can trust you and live for you like never before. Friend, listen, God doesn't call you to something that he's not going to walk with you through it, through the power of his son, Jesus, and he's sending to die on the cross for you. Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer very quickly? Father, we love you and we thank you for your word, for your goodness and for your blessings for this team that leads just so very well. God, I thank you for our church, for our brothers and sisters that come alongside and fight with each other to encourage each other to be all they can be in Christ. God, I don't know what's going on in the room today. I didn't get a phone call or a text to encourage me to preach a specific message Lord, I'm just doing what you've told me to do, but God, I pray that if you're working in hearts today, that even in the quietness of their, this moment, there might be brothers and sisters who are doing some work with you right now in their seats. Whether it's a prayer of confession, whether it's a prayer of repentance, whether it's a prayer of, of accountability and who that person might be to hold them accountable, God, help us to resist and to fight. Father, if there's one here that does not know you as Savior, I pray today would be that day. Every head bowed, every eye closed, just very quickly today. Listen, friend, I hope you didn't hear this message today as some guy up here trying to judge where you are in your life, because that's not my heart. But I do want you to know this before you leave today, that God of the universe sees you, knows you, loves you. 
sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you that you might have everlasting life. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The scripture says in Romans chapter 3, we read it earlier, that sin that happened in the garden passed down a sin nature for all of us. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. This isn't a message about what you've done. It's a message about what we've all done. We've all sinned. And we've all fallen short. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friend, God offers you the gift of salvation today if you put your faith and your trust in him. God offers you the gift of salvation today. If you will confess your sins, the scripture says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you are here today and you say, Grant, I've never put my faith and trust in Jesus. I know I'm a sinner and I'm not perfect. But there's never been that moment where I've put my faith and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. I want to encourage you, right? where you're seated today to just pray this prayer the best you know how in faith. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you. Would you just pray that prayer in your seat today, watching online? Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you. I believe you died in my place and I want to receive you right now as my savior. Would you make that your prayer this morning, friend? Just the best you know how. Just pray this prayer. Jesus, I'm sorry for all my sins. Please forgive me. I believe that you alone are the Lord, and I surrender all of me to you right now. Fred, if you made that decision online or on campus today, I want to encourage you to tell someone that you made that decision today before you leave. I want to encourage you to go by these back walls, these fresh start spots on the back walls, and grab one of those bags as a gift from us to you today. If you made that decision online, text the name Jesus to 98085. We want to see you grow in your relationship with him and be all that you can be through Christ. Father, we love you and we praise you today. God, strengthen us today to avoid temptation and to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.